this discussion tonight came from um, really a, a celebration of Robert Burns from um, a Sunday. And the issue tonight is really the question of how to deal with the crisis that we face today in the same way that uh, really Abraham Lincoln was able to deal with the crisis that he faced uh, at the time of the Civil War, which was clearly um, caused by the British. At least maybe, maybe it was not so clear to everyone at the time, but it is clear now that we're facing the same enemy today. And what Lincoln drew on was a truth that was recognized by the great poet um, Percy Shelley, who wrote um, in this volume, uh, A Defense of Poetry. At the end of that, I just wanna read a few words which sets the stage for this, what I wanna talk about. Shelley had written, and I should just point out that Shelley was considered uh, one of the gravest threats to the British uh, oligarchical establishment and was recognized as one of their greatest threats. Um, but he wrote that the most unfailing herald companion and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. At such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating and receiving intense and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even whilst they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated upon the throne of their own soul. Uh, and then he says toward the end of this work, Poets are the hierophants of an unapprehended apprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present, the words which express what they understand not, the trumpets which sing to battle and feel not what they inspire, the influence which is moved not but moves. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And this truth, uh, in the case of people like Robert Burns and certainly Friedrich Schiller and, and some other great poets, uh, including uh, Edgar Allan Poe and Paul Dunbar. Um, these are the people which actually are doing the moving as well. They're not simply poets. They're trying to change the society, the thinking, because in order to deal with the political crisis and specifically to free man from the enslavement of both their senses and the economic enslavement of the oligarchy, it is necessary to step outside of the realm of um, existing methods of thinking. In the same way that Lyndon LaRouche often said that poetry must supersede mathematics, deductive logic, in order to make creative breakthroughs. Now, this is actually seen and expressed very directly in the case of Abraham Lincoln uh, and also Robert Burns, because both were being enslaved, were facing the enslavement of their society by the British Empire. Um, Lincoln was a dedicated, committed follower to what was called the American system, uh, which built the United States. And Burns was an advocate and a dedicated committed follower of the American Revolution who was suffering the economic consequences of the British system. Now, Lincoln could not have done what he did in the Civil War and leading up to the Civil War without the inspiration of the poet, Robert Burns, who is of course the great national poet of Scotland, but beyond Scotland, he's actually a poet of freedom. And his ideas, in his poetry were clearly picked up in the United States at a very early time because Lincoln picked up Burns's work when he was in the uh, frontier of uh, Indiana, moving into Illinois. And by the time he was 18 years old, it was actually said that he had virtually memorized most of Burns's poetry. Um, he also, um, when he was in Illinois as a young man and is maybe 30 years old, he had actually been, in, been introduced to Shakespeare at the same time. 
And I want to just read you the effect that both Burns and Shakespeare had on Abraham Lincoln. Um, I mean, one, uh, one writer who knew Lincoln very well said that, uh, um, that Lincoln used to recite poetry by the hour and, uh, and, 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 and knew virtually all of Burns's poetry by heart. But in Lincoln's election campaign of 1860, his official campaign biography said that, um, uh, and Lincoln read this and did not correct it, so he was agreeing with this. It said that um, uh, Lincoln uh, carried a copy of Burns's poetry throughout the circuit court uh, when he was a lawyer, and that he had he had virtually memorized all of it uh, at the time. Um, but I want to just read you a similar thinking. It's easy to see why Lincoln would be attracted to Robert Burns. Um, Burns was a poor farmer who had to work very hard, hard work at a time uh, when the lands were being cleared in Scotland, when farmers were being driven off the land, um, when it was very hard uh, and it was intended to make it impossible for them to survive. And uh, Burns nevertheless had actually himself read Shakespeare, um, many other great writers, and had actually mastered the ability to not only express himself in verse, but to actually express uh, what Friedrich Schiller described as suppressing his simply personal sentiments, which people today take to mean poetry. That is your feelings, your emotions, et cetera. That's poetry, whatever you feel. Whereas what Burns was able to do is express the love for humanity and be able to actually get people to ironically, with humor, with satire, with insight, actually look at themselves and laugh. And many people know the, the famous um, um, stanza in To a Laos where he says, the power the gift he gave us to see ourselves as others see us, uh, to look at yourself, to look at society. But he had a tremendous love of humanity. Here a poor farmer is expressing the emotions of his fellow citizens. And he wrote some of the, and these are some of the poems which, which Lincoln loved to recite. Um, one was a poem which was, um, let me just see if I can find this. I just wanna read a couple of stanzas of this to give you an idea of his, his, love, his love of the people. The purpose of the poetry was to uplift people because how are you gonna free yourself from a system of slavery if you yourself are enslaved to the ideas which the people who run the society want you to think. Uh, <clears throat> but this was a poem which it was said that Lincoln virtually had memorized the whole thing. It's a rather long poem called The Carter's Saturday Night. And this is a poem dedicated to the poor of Scotland who work all week. And then on the weekend, they're able to actually uh, relax with their family and it's the preface to the poem, it actually sort of gives the idea uh, away. It's entitled, let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. And it ends, you know, in terms of comparing the poor with the great nobles and aristocrats of England, he describes the scene of of, um, of, um, of relaxation and, and, and enjoyment among the family in a poor home in Scotland and says, um, from scenes like these old Scotia's grandeur springs that makes her loved at home, never revered abroad. Princes and lords are but the breath of kings and honest man's the noblest work of God. And search in fair virtue's heavenly road, the cottage leaves the palace far behind. What is a lordling's pomp, a cumbrous load, disguising all the wretch of humankind, studied in arts of hell, in wickedness refined? So you can see why Lincoln would actually enjoy <coughs> attacking the great lords and ladies in order to unlift the population. Now, Lincoln's view of his mission in life is very similar to what uh, 
Robert uh, Burns actually said himself. But uh, Lincoln actually, um, just see. Well, his view of actually, he said, I have, this is Lincoln, I have an irrepressible desire to live till I can be assured that the world is a little better for my having lived in it. And Burns wrote a letter to a, to a person where he said that I, for poor old Scotland's sake, some useful plan or book could make or sing a song at least. So they both had a commitment to uplift humanity at a time when in Scotland it was being destroyed by the British Empire. And in America, at the time that Lincoln came to know uh, Robert Burns and Shakespeare, um, the United States was being destroyed by the British because they were crushing what was called the American system. They had they were wrecking the Bank of England, which, I mean the Bank of uh, the United States, which set up by Hamilton, and cutting off credit, causing economic breakdown. This is when Jackson was put in there and was was destroying the Bank of England. And it was exactly at the time that Lincoln discovered Burns, discovered Shakespeare that he began to actually campaign for the American system. At the same time, he ran, I believe his first race in 1832, this would have been right after he is reported to have stopped reciting Burns. He ran for state representative in Illinois and said right off his first speech was that his platform was very clear. Internal improvements, a national bank, and, um, uh, and, and a tariff protection against the British, which was actually flooding the United States with um, cheap goods in order to destroy industry. <clears throat> Let me just, uh, just take a look here on, just further on Abraham Lincoln's use of Robert Burns. Um, I mean, one, uh, one law clerk in, Lin in 1840 uh, said that Lincoln could quote very clearly all of Burns' poems by harmony, by memory. I have frequently heard him quote the whole, and these are several poems of Burns, Tom O'Shanter, Holy Willie's Prayer, which is actually a very funny attack on someone who's praying for God to forgive him for his sins, but go damn you know, his neighbors and send them to hell. Um, and also this one I just read, The Carter's Saturday Night. He could quote that by heart. He acquired the Scottish accent um, and could render Burns perfectly. I have been with him in that little office and heard him uh, recite with the greatest of admiration and zest Burns's ballads and quaint things. That was one of the sources of his wisdom and his wit. As years passed on, he did not quote Burns as much as he had then taken up Shakespeare and who he became greatly interested in. And yet I fancy that a great deal of Abraham Lincoln is bottomed on Robert Burns and William Shakespeare. Now, when Lincoln was in the White House, he would frequently, as people know, quote Shakespeare, especially from the tragedies, to educate his cabinet on what they were dealing with because he had to look at history. He couldn't just look at the immediate present. And people may know in Burns' famous poem to a mouse, which we heard on Sunday night, where he was attacking the, the, the removal, the clearances of the highlands uh, of Scotland by the British to bring in sheep, get rid of people. And he was referring to a mouse who was being driven from its nest. He says at the end um, to the mouse that um, uh, still thou art blessed compared with me, the present only touches thee. But ach, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forward, though I cannot see, I guess and fear. And Lincoln was always thinking in terms of history. So he was looking at Shakespeare in terms of the tragedies, which actually depict the methods of thinking of the oligarchy, which also to the 
to the thinking mind show how you can defeat them because you can see what their own weaknesses are, how they constantly make the same mistakes. <clears throat> but Lincoln had to be aware of this. He was also aware of how the oligarchy um, manipulated events, manipulated people. I mean, I know if people remember, and, and I'm sure Shakespeare was quite aware of this, in Henry VI, the history play, one of the history plays, Shakespeare actually describes how the oligarchy, and I think in this case, the, the uh, Duke of York, organizes a rebellion to overthrow the government. People may know that's where you had the famous line about kill all the lawyers, where he, they actually hired a, an instigator, provocateur, you may be familiar with these these days, to overthrow the government in order to bring in the House of York to then rule the country. All right, so it was an organized operation. Um, but um, what Lincoln said at the end of his life, oh, actually, I want to just read this about Lincoln, because this actually demonstrates this involvement in poetry and history and drama. It illustrates exactly what Schiller was talking about, that in order to free a people from slavery, to free people politically, Schiller insisted political change was not enough. This was after the American Revolution. And at the time of the French Revolution, it was clear at that point, it was through beauty that you had to proceed to freedom. You had to have also a cultural shift where man could actually master his emotions. Otherwise he could be manipulated exactly as in Shakespeare's play with this example of um, uh, the manipulated insurrection in England. Um, but this is what Lincoln just said, writing to one of his law partners or remarking to his law partner, is how he thought, which was further, I would say, enhanced by his looking at poetry. He said, there are no accidents in my philosophy. Every effect must have a cause. The past is the cause of the present and the present will be the cause of the future. All these are links in the endless chain stretching from the infinite to the finite. Now, if you're gonna have that idea of changing history, you have to be immersed in going beyond what you see immediately before you, like the mouse. You have to actually have a sense of the past leading into the future. And in order to get above the existing methods of thinking, the enslavement to your senses, the enslavement to uh, propaganda and, and enemy um, manipulation, a grounding in this type of poetry, which is classical poetry, is essential, which is why Lincoln, to do what he did, had to study and be immersed in this type of thinking. And actually, if at the end of his life, <clears throat> he was asked to frame a toast to Robert Burns, because it was known that he loved Burns. And this was in, 18, in the last year of his life at the uh, anniversary of Burns' birthday in 1865. And he actually wrote back to the Burns dinner and said, I cannot frame a toast to Burns. I can say nothing worthy of his generous heart and transcendent genius. Thinking of what he has said, I cannot say anything worth saying. But what he said in his great um, speeches, such as the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural, his last famous speech, was clearly shaped by his reading of both Burns and Shakespeare. Because what he said, his final reference to Burns, just about a week before he died, before he was killed, he was talking to John Hay, who was the nephew of his original law, par, or law clerk, Milton Hay, from 20 years ago. And he said, as they were, they were discussing, this is just before his assassination, maybe a few days before, and they're on the Potomac on a boat, and uh, they're having a literary discussion. He's quoting from Shakespeare, he's discussing Hamlet, he's discussing Macbeth. And then he starts quoting from Robert Burns, and he says to Hay, after he quotes a famous uh, well, a, a poem by Burns, where Burns expresses his um, admiration for a particular benefactor of his. And, and Lincoln said, you can't express it any better than this. He said, uh, the poem was, the bridegroom may forget the 
the bride was made his wife yesterine, the monarch may forget the crown that on his head has been, the mother may forget the bairn that smiles so sweetly on her knee, but I'll remember thee, Glen Cairn, and all thou hast done for me. And at that point, Lincoln turns to Hay, and he says, Hay, Burns never touched sentiment without coming to it, without carrying it to its ultimate expression and leaving nothing further to be said. And this is the kind of thinking Lincoln had to, wanted to express when you heard the Gettysburg Address. What more could be said? Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, or his famous last speech, uh, second inaugural, where he took an idea and compressed it to as far as you could go. And he said, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3000 years ago, still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us the light, uh, uh, gives us the, the right. Now, Robert Burns's poetry also inspired Frederick Douglass, who had, who had actually previously been inspired by Shakespeare as well as anything else he could read, great speeches. But when he discovered Burns, <coughs> he actually recognized in Burns himself the same fight against slavery. Even though Burns was obviously not black, uh, Douglas recognized in the way Burns had been treated as a poor farmer and the conditions in which he lived. In fact, he said that Burns was treated as a brute who they tried to keep, you know, tied down until he unmoored himself. And he identified himself, Douglas, escaping from slavery and then traveling and speaking against slavery. He actually identified that with Robert Burns. And when he went over to England and then toward Scotland, he was quoting Robert Burns constantly, a man's a man for that. And he quoted a, a, a funny poem about address to the deal, the devil saying the deal has business here, attacking slavery in England itself and Scotland. That is, even though he was invited there, there were people making money, of course, off slavery. And of course, the whole British system was based on slavery. Um, so that was very important in terms of Douglas expressing his ideas. And what, what I would just say this, that in order that the connection between the American system and freeing the American bring the population from slavery and was was recognized by Henry Carey, Lincoln's chief economic advisor, as really freeing the world from the British system. That the particular aspects of black slavery were a derivative, were part of the entire British system, which included what was being done in Scotland, in Ireland, in India, in the West Indies all over the world. He said there are two systems before the world, the American system and the British system. And um, the British wanted to use, while they set up slavery, they originally set up slavery in America and would not let the colonies get, get rid of it. <coughs> Afterwards, they were actually trying to use slavery to split the United States. And you know, after the Civil War, the question became very clear that in order to end slavery, you had to develop the economy. You couldn't simply end slavery and bring in sharecropping and keep the South backward. But that's what happened after Lincoln's assassination. And that's a whole story in itself. But Douglas is interesting. He did not really understand this question of the American system, I believe, before the Civil War. But after the Civil War, during the fight of a reconstruction, I know that in the Library of Congress papers of his, which you can look up on the internet, there actually is an article by Henry Carey, one of the last articles he wrote, it appears, in the year of his death, where he actually discusses 
how the credit was being cut off in the South, which was actually driving people off the land, very similar to what had been going on in Scotland earlier. And that this was the result of a policy of monopolizing wealth, which was really the beginning of the end of the American system, even though we continued to grow and develop. You had the Specie Resumption Act where the, uh, where the, um, the greenbacks were withdrawn, which had been providing credit during the Civil War. Now, the final person I wanna just mention in this regard, because we're talking about how to get rid of slavery and the poetic inspiration necessary to do that. Not simply an economic policy, but you have to inspire people to actually fight for such a policy and understand it. This, the last person I wanna just reference was really a protege, a person that was promoted by Frederick Douglass, um, which was Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was born um, to parents who were, had been slaves. His father had actually uh, uh, left the United States through the Underground Railroad and gone to Canada, then came back and fought in the Civil War when Douglas had organized African Americans to join the Union Army and had convinced Lincoln, Lincoln to allow that. And, and, and it was a very important contribution. It was at least 200,000 soldiers that fought, which played a critical role, <coughs> especially toward the end. But Douglas was confronted um, with the fact that at the end of his life, the Jim Crow laws were being brought back, blacks were being denied the right to vote. Um, the, um, the, the economic policy of the South was going back to a form of slavery, even worse. Um, and he turned to Dunbar, to Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was an emerging poet, um, who actually expressed how to free mankind in his mind. Because the key is if you wanna overcome this type of slavery, you have to first free your mind. And Douglas uh, recognized in Dunbar, the poet of the future, whom he actually promoted um, at the Chicago World's Fair, I think in 1893, just before he died a few years later. Um, and Dunbar, uh, I just wanna read this quick thing. He wrote a poem, you can look this up, um, the Burns poem is called A Man's a Man for uh, That, in terms of you know, getting rid of the whole idea that there's some separation of mankind, which coincided with exactly Lincoln's view that his main idea was the Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And Dunbar wrote a poem in the um, early 1890s called My Sort of Man, which starts off saying, I don't believe in aristocrats and never did you see, uh, but it ends by, by exactly the same idea as Burns, which is the man who simply sits and waits for good to come along, ain't worth the breath that one would take to tell him he is wrong. For good ain't flowing round this world for every fool to sup. You've got to put your seers on and go and hunt it up. Good goes with honesty, I say, to honor and to bless, to rich and poor alike, it brings a wealth of happiness. The aristocrats ain't got it all, for much to their surprise. It's one of Earth's most blessed things they can't monopolize. So I'm gonna end it there, um, but I wanna just stress the following, that it is clear that in order to defeat the enemy today, you have to have, as Friedrich Schiller said, as Shelley insisted, and as the people I've illustrated today um, made clear, you have to combine the fight for an economic freedom from this British system today worldwide. And that was, that was the view of Henry Carey as well. You can't just do it in one country. You've got to free the world. That was the role of the United States. But in order to carry out that freedom, you've got to free your mind to be able to think in these terms. Otherwise you can be manipulated by the enemy out of fear, out of uh, pessimism or, or, or whatever they want to throw at you. So this question of freedom for the mind is as true today for us as it was for Abraham Lincoln. Well, I'll end it right there. <laughs>